Hi, this is Phil Newman from Longevity Technology, and I'm delighted to say that I'm joined today by uh, Anna Van Ghosh, who is the CEO of Unity Biotechnology. Now, Unity is on a mission to develop uh, synthetic therapies to slow or halt or reverse aging. And the company is initially focused on age-related eye diseases and neurologic conditions. So, uh, Anna Van, welcome. Thank you, Phil. Thank you for having me. Well, great. I mean, and, and really, I, I would say a coup to have you, Anavan, because you know you, your your company is really legendary in the in the space of longevity. And of course, you recently announced the positive results from your phase two trial uh, on patients with uh, diabetic macular edema, which was great, really positive to see. So, can you maybe just talk us through those results? Absolutely, Phil. Um, let me just to provide some context about how we ended up with eye diseases, and then I'll walk you through the DME results. Um, you know, the fundamental concept behind Senalytics applies to diseases across the body. You know, there's an accumulation of senescent cells in many tissues and many organs. And frankly, what got me interested in Unity when I joined about three years ago was that broad promise that we could develop senolytic therapies that could have impact across diseases. Uh, we also felt that it was going to be important to show proof of concept that targeting senescent cells can provide therapeutic benefit and find, needed to find a disease and, and an organ system where to demonstrate that. And eye diseases turned out to be a really good place because we had seen evidence that there was accumulation of senescent cells in eye diseases like AMD and DME. And um, we had a wealth of preclinical evidence that suggested that elimination of senescent cells could restore tissue health in the eye. Now, this is in the context of a disease in diabetic macular edema where the patients typically receive an injection of an anti-VEGF into the eye every other month. That's a standard treatment. And despite that heavy treatment burden, a good fraction of patients, about half the patients, do not get to driving vision. So they have residual visual deficit even after one or two years of treatment. So we felt that that was a population where we could see whether eliminating senescent cells could provide added value. So in the study that we just completed and shared results from, we gave patients uh, who had previously been on anti-VEGF and achieved their plateau with anti-VEGF. We removed anti-VEGF from the treatment paradigm and instead gave them a single injection of UBX1325, which is a lead senolytic molecule. And then remarkably, this is just two weeks old result, 48 weeks out, just about a year out, um, patients had gained about six and a half letters compared to where they had started. And over half the patients did not need any other injection during that entire period, right? So we took patients who were getting an injection every six weeks and could give them this durable benefit. So we're quite excited about that. Yeah, great. And when you, and when you say um, six letters, is that six letters going down the list or is that six letters going across? Yeah, you know, the, <clears throat> the ATDRS letter chart is not unlike the vision charts you see in an optometrist office. And um, so about five letters is being able to see a whole extra line. And, and that is often how physicians will think of it. So giving patients more than a line of vision is considered significant. Yeah. And importantly, there'll be patients who are moving from you know, non-driving vision into driving vision, which in terms of their function has a huge impact. Right, right. Well, it's, it sounds sounds wonderful. And of course, you know, uh, for the patients as well, changing that protocol from those regular treatments into something which is obviously at this stage looking like it's much more permanent is fascinating. So you're at this phase two stage. Are you going to a next phase two phase, like two, 2B or something like that? What, what's, yeah, what, so the what next study would be a phase 2B study. Uh, I want to comment on one element of the impact um, of durability, what it means beyond just patient convenience. Um, the mechanism works by removing senescent cells that should really restore the health of the vasculature of the eye and bring it to a better, better state. Yep. And um, we believe that this could represent a potential for disease modification. So that over time, the fact that you're needing less injection reflects the fact that you have modified the course of disease and maybe even getting better, yep. uh, which is part of the kind of core mission of Unity to provide therapies like this. And this is in contrast with an anti-VEGF, which not only has a heavy treatment burden, but the disease, underlying disease continues to progress. Mm -hmm. And so over time, patients will get back to the vision they started with, or maybe even worse. Now, yeah. moving on to the next study, talking about the phase 2B study, uh, the first study we ran was a sham control study. So it's a controlled study, randomized controlled study. The patient and physicians do not know which treatment arm they're on. 
they're either getting uh, UBX 1325, a senolytic agent, or they're getting a sham procedure, which is a pretty standard design to show initial efficacy of a drug. In the next study, we would like to show how it compares to a flibercept, which is the leading anti-VEGF in the field in a head-to-head -head study. So the next study, a phase 2B study, we expect would have um, at least two arms. One would be a UBX 1325 arm, so you can get a confirm the efficacy of that agent. And the comparator arm would be a standard every eight week of liver sub dosing. And so on the other side, we have the potential of creating a data set that shows in a head-to-head -head study whether or not we might provide superior benefit. So Anavan, obviously, it hasn't all been plain sailing. The um, non-inferiority in a, in a wet age-related macular degeneration trial uh, is something that you've experienced now. Um, so maybe you, could you just talk us through that, the context of what you've learned through that failure and how that can be applied to what you're doing going forward? Yeah, Phil, so as you noted, uh, we also ran a study in wet AMD. And uh, that's another major disease of the eye. And we know that there's senescence burden in AMD. And we know the target BCL Excel is expressed in AMD patients. Uh, nevertheless, in that head-to-head non-inferiority study, we did not hit non-inferiority compared to flibercept. Now, there are a couple of important things we learned from the study. One was that um, you know, much of the results of that study could be explained by an unexpected early gain on the flibercept arm. And that really indicated that we didn't have an adequate run-in in that arm. So typically, when patients are switching from one anti-VEGF to a flibercept, they can have some kind of a treatment effect, um, and we needed to dial that out. But more importantly, I think the most interesting element of that data set in secondary analysis was that patients who had longer disease duration responded significantly better than patients who had more recent disease duration. And um, so that suggested the disease duration had an impact on how well UBX might work. And uh, interestingly, it turns out that there's an accumulation of senescent cells over time in AMD. So if you look at recently diagnosed AMD patients, you don't see as much senescent cells, whereas in patients who have been diagnosed for over two or three years, you see greater accumulation. So it actually all kind of adds up. When you look at the data in greater detail, you find that you, know, you probably have to be selective about the patients you're targeting to see maximum benefit. Uh, incidentally, in the DME case, DME happens after very long disease duration. So those patients had diabetic disease for 15 years, had DME diagnosis for about three years. So they're all in a phase of kind of chronic phase of disease. So I think in the AMD disease, we learned that you have to be quite careful about the phase of disease when you're targeting, uh, as well as certain design elements of the trial. I think moving beyond the eye, it'll be important, I think, to understand both what stage of disease is, is characterized by high senescence burden, as well as which uh, senolytic targets would be most effective. Yeah, I guess that's quite interesting because it's relating to the knowledge that you now have applying that really into a much more focused domain for, for both the, the target diseases and the stages and the patient conditions. So that's that's interesting. So that's, a, I guess, a key learning for you. And of course, all of this needs capital and it's a pretty tough environment out there at the moment. You know, how, how is the company doing in terms of its financial ability to take on all of these these new challenges? Yeah, it is. Uh, it's a tough market out there, and it's it's hard to raise money as a small cap public company. Um, and it's interesting. I'm learning that there is this added element about um, what it takes to get public investors comfortable with a new concept. You know, we're really talking about pioneering. You know, never before seen treatment paradigms uh, for most people in in even in the industry. Uh, or in the investor community, what a senolytic, senolytic agent is or what it might do is is quite foreign. There are not a bunch of senescence companies out there. And, and as you pointed out, Unity was kind of really far ahead in deciding to target senescence as a way of uh, uh, affecting age-related diseases. So I feel that we need to continue to develop strong, compelling clinical data. And, and I believe that the data set that we just released is going to create a lot of confidence uh, both with the markets and potential partners. You know, as we develop these agents and go into late stage, I think partners, partnerships with uh, other larger pharma companies or biotech companies is going to be critical. So I think we, uh, we need to kind of deliver the kind of data sets we have to build conviction. And then people will look back and say, well, you know, if you look back, you, you saw that this drug was doing something way back when.
Yeah, interesting. And I guess the uh, the, the whole subject, as you say, of uh, xenotherapeutics is one which really Unity was a, a, a pioneer of. And of course, uh, as we all know, other companies have started to come in. And there's you know, obviously people like James Kirkland have talked about the, uh, the, the, the nature of xenotherapeutics and their potential for success. Uh, what's, what's your thoughts on the, on the state of the xenotherapeutics market now as an early player and seeing what's happening? Do you take comfort out of the fact that there's more happening now? Absolutely. I mean, it's still early days, but I think it's a very exciting phase in the growth of uh, senescence-directed therapies. And I'll just kind of note a couple of things that I think um, will likely happen in the next few years, and I think there'll be very exciting developments. One is around new ways of targeting senescent cells. So you know, we started out uh, looking to eliminate senescent cells from various tissues, and um, we'll continue to explore that in other indications beyond the eye. There's good evidence of senescence drive in neurologic diseases and, and other diseases. Um, among the uh, approaches that I find particularly interesting is, is their approaches to see if one if one can reprogram senescent cells. You know, one of the problems is the senescent cells are secreting damaging factors that's just causing havoc in the tissue, and so those approaches that reprogram it so that you know the senescence uh, related factors are not produced, I think, are very exciting. The other thing I really like are, are approaches of you know somehow arming the immune system or engineered cells to go hunt senescent cells. So we, we think there's senescent cells throughout our body and they're accumulating. They're innate mechanisms that remove them, but sometimes they're not adequate. So it is, it is this idea of saying that, well, is there something on the surface of senescent cells I could identify and then go and like, you know, have this targeted elimination, I think could be a really exciting development. So you feel that is that something that you guys are really starting to work on now in terms of targeting? And because you know, that is, it's, a, it's a fascinating aspect of the whole xenotherapeutic philosophy. Yeah, I mean, we have um, explored this in, in a number of ways. I'll, I'll tell you that you know, we started out, and I would say still our key focus has been around seeing whether we can find these nodes in senescent cells that we can target with a small molecule that will eliminate them. So the Achilles heels of senescent cells. And what we've learned is that in different tissues, that susceptibility node might be different. So as BCLX cell might work very well in eye disease, in kidney disease or brain disease, there might be something else you need to target to eliminate senescent cells. Having said that, in our long-term plans, there is interest in seeing whether or not we can find cell surface molecules and senescent cells that could allow this more targeted elimination using the immune system. Mm. Yeah, well, I guess, uh, Anavin, it's, it's quite interesting to, to look beyond xenotherapeutics as well, really as a, as a pioneering company in, the, in this field of longevity, which has obviously become much firmer now from, from the time when you started. What, what are your thoughts on the longevity field in general and, and really investors and the market's appetite to age-related therapies? Yeah, it's interesting. And you know, I almost see um, you know, two somewhat parallel movements growing, if you will. On, on one hand, um, and often what gets a fair bit of attention in popular press are people seeing what can you do with existing supplements and other you know, over-the-counter drugs and treatments that would allow you to maintain cells in a healthier state and improve, improve your health span. Um, and, and that is very much like a supplement market world, I would say. On the other hand, there are, there are companies that I think will develop therapeutics, things that would be you know, uh, approved by the EMA or FDA, which would be uh, aging biology targeting uh, drugs that will alter the disease trajectory. And of course, that's the bucket that we are, we are in. Yeah. Uh, within that, I'll just highlight, you know, I think there's a lot of fascinating work being done. One, one area that I find a very interesting intersection is around like mitochondrial biology, which uh, clearly has a role in aging and in age-related diseases and senescence-related biology. Now, we don't understand the intersection very well, but it is worth noting that um, BCLX cell, which is our target, is highly expressed in the mitochondria. So it's possible that that's part of where it's exerting its biology. And it's also possible that as you damage mitochondria, you have a higher propensity to become a senescent cell. So I think that there will be some convergence of theories as to what is happening in a, uh, in a, in a kind of deeper sense that is shared between these mechanisms. In the beginning, there will be, it'll seem like there are 15 different mechanisms. You talk to 15 people, they'll give you 15 different things to look at, but they're probably, it, uh, it's an underlying biology that is really driving much of it. Oh, well, fascinating. Well, Anavan, well, obviously we could go on uh, in this conversation for a long time, but I know you're a, you're a busy guy. So thanks for joining us today. It's been fascinating. 
Well, thanks so much for having me, Phil.